Sabbath to you, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our worship hour. This is a little bit challenging um, a service for us in the musical part. We don't have a pianist or organist today. Most of our, I mean, young people are in Puslinch. We have a special youth event there. But uh, we are not discouraged. We will uh, do what we can. And the Lord accepts the best we can do in the circumstances. And we read in the Sabbath school that the Lord, God is not looking so much at, uh, at so much at how much you do, but what are motives, intentions. Do you do it with love? So, of course, we always try to do our best, but the Lord will uh, substitute or make up for the imperfection if we have it in some areas. I'm very happy to see a good number of you. Uh, we have many visitors today. I, I wish to welcome each one of you to our church today. And um, uh, I um, pray that God would um, bless you as you uh, spend time together with us in this congregation. I'll tell you one thing. I am not a lover of very great churches. I'd rather prefer smaller companies. You have more intimacy, you have more direct contact with people, and so God doesn't depend on the numbers. Um, even when we have most of our members here, we are not a big church, but look, Jesus said, um, fear not little flock. It was a little flock. You know, when disciples ask, Lord, will there be many who will be saved? What did he say? Press to enter into a straight or narrow gate. You know, Broad is the way which leads into destruction, and many are there, but there are few who walk on the narrow path and who go through this straight gate. Today I'd like to continue a topic, continue in a way, uh, that I presented a few weeks ago here, and this is the theme of the great controversy. Today I'd like to talk about the second coming of Christ in the context of the great controversy. So we are, we are now people who are expecting that soon, coming, a return of our Lord Jesus Christ. But now, we have to understand that there is a bigger picture than just the second coming of Christ or our personal salvation. There is a bigger story that is uh, in which we are involved, and we touch on it from time to time. But today I'd like to tell you that we, and we and don't understand our role that we have in the world today. We don't understand what's going really in the world unless we understand this bigger story. When I was studying and preparing for exams, I always wanted to have an overview of the whole subject matter that I'm preparing. I don't like, you know, and this is what even some people who are workers, employees resent. And unfortunately, in the corporate, large corporations, um, if you're an employee, uh, mid middle level or lower level, you are doing particular tasks and you probably never get to know really what's going on in the whole business, the corporation. People who are the top, top executives, they know strategic decisions, what's really going on. Uh, smaller guys, they just do routine work and they don't know what is going on. Now, God is so good and gracious to us that he reveals to us what is the big story. He's the top executive. He is running the, this universe and this planet Earth. But he wants to tell you and me what is really going on and what is your and my role in this great controversy. He doesn't want you to be just a little wheel in a big machine. He wants you to know, yes, each one of us has a role to play. It's a very important role as this great controversy unfolds. So today, I'd like to give you this big picture, this big frame, that you better understand where we are in the stream of time and what's going on in this world. So the purpose of the great controversy is to allow every rational being in the universe to see in Satan and his principles what God has seen all along. Now in the Sabbath school, Sister Sonia mentioned today, that when the Israelites were in Egyptian slavery and the Lord was preparing to deliver them from the slavery, the Lord permitted them to suffer to a high extent. Uh, when Moses came to them and promised deliverance, what happened? Their taskmasters demanded from them to make bricks 
even in more difficult circumstances, without straw, same quantity they want to be produced, but, you know, making your, your task difficult. So, what we are talking here, God had a, God had a purpose for Israelites before he led them out from Egypt. He wanted them to see what is Egypt, who is the Pharaoh, his true character, oppressive, dictatorial, no humanity, no compassion for human beings, you know, treating you like a dirt. God wants Israel to understand that the bond in Egypt is a not good place for them, and he wants to show them who he is. That is a part of the great controversy. So today we would like to go in the distant past, we will have a veil removed before our eyes, and we will be able to look to behold something that happened in this universe before this world was created. And uh, let's see which events. We will go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, and I'd like to read from verse 14. Now you will see that there was someone, highest created being, who rebelled against his creator. Verse 14, Ezekiel 28, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, before I read further, what brings to your, what this picture or these words bring to your mind, anointed uh, covering cherub? What image you have before your mind? The Ark of the Covenant. And what were there? Two covering cherubs. That's right. So, now the prophet says, someone was a covering cherub in the immediate presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. So, some, he was standing there. And I have, I continue, verse 14, and I have set thee so. So, I have ordained you. Other translations. So, God ordained him. Thou wast set, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Wow. Isn't that amazing? An angel, highest created angel, was in immediate, in immediate God's presence on the holy mountain of God, in the midst of fire. You know, we know that around God it is like a burning fire. So he was there. But look, the following verse, verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found where? In you or in thee. Where was found iniquity? In him. In thee. Iniquity. What is iniquity? Sin. Lawlessness. Uh huh. Now, who was only able to see sin in him? God only. Can you and I see sin in someone? We cannot see if it's not displayed outside. So, God is the only one who can see. But please note what happened with Satan is going inside his mind. If you go to verse 16. What was this sin inside? Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So, let's move on. He was dis not destroyed from existence. What do you see here? I will cast, I will... Therefore, I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain of God. So he was not destroyed or blotted out of existence. He was just fired from his job. He cannot be any more covering cherub. You understand that? God just fired him. Did not destroy him at that time. He, did, he cast him out. He was not blotted out. Now, there, are, there is an objection to Christianity. Some people say, if God saw this iniquity in Lucifer, why God did not destroy him on the spot? You heard about that. 
You know, so God, God, I will address this issue in a moment. But we, we have an answer to that question as the passage continues. Let's go to verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted the wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Other translations that they may gaze at you. Why God did not destroy him at a spot? But he cast him out. He laid him on the ground that others may gaze at you. What does it mean? God no, now cast Lucifer to the ground that others may gaze at him. Is it possible that something is going inside in people and that is not expressed outside? Huh? You are sitting here in this pews. You're looking at me. You may be smiling. And this is what I see. I don't know what's going on in your minds. And maybe I better don't know, right? <laughs> But uh, what I want to say is, uh, you see, we have to understand what was going on in heaven when, when, when this was happening, when he rebelled. God can see, but other created beings cannot see. Yeah, they cannot see. So, Christ sees through. He sees not only to you, he sees through you. And notice the reason why Lucifer was cast out and not blotted out, that they may gaze at you. It's fascinating. Fascinating. If you go to another text that describes the same thing, and this is in Isaiah 14. If you go to Isaiah 14, a very interesting description. And we go from verse, this is another perspective. In Isaiah 14, we are having the same thing, but now from the future, when he will be ultimately destroyed. Now we are looking from the future, when Lucifer will be destroyed, who became a Satan. The same thing is described. Now let's read from verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did, didst weaken the nations? <laughs> wow. He was again cast to the ground. Why? What was he saying? For thou hast said where? In thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Where did he say it first? In his heart. It was not visible. Other created beings could not see it. But he said in his heart. God knew it, but others did not know it. Now let's go on. And then in, after these eyes, verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. You shall be. This is future. Not immediately. It will happen in the future. And uh, why? Verse 16. Again, the same thing. They, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the, north, the earth to tremble? that did shake kingdoms. Did you notice the same thing? You shall be brought down to the side of the pits. That they that see shall see thee, yeah, that they see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. He will be gazed upon. He will be looked upon again. But people who will behold him, right? And ask, is this the man who shook the earth? Verse 17. That made the world as wilderness and destroy the cities thereof that open not the house of his prisoners. In the Sabbath school today, we talk about deliverance from Egypt, right? Satan, Lucifer, who became Satan, he likes to hold the prisoners. He likes to keep people in bondage, be it Egypt or, or in bondage of sin. Some of you, brethren, have experienced that. You know that bondage. It can be addictions. But you know, the greatest bondage is self. Our carnal nature. That's a terrible bondage. So we are enslaved and we need freedom. So they will be asking, when, this, when they see the judgment upon him, they will be asking the question, is this possible that this happened to him? This mighty high angel who was, you know, 
how this can happen. It's important to observe that both Ezekiel and Isaiah bring out how Lucifer was cast out and blotted out, but not blotted out, because God can see what created beings cannot see. Now, let us, let us imagine what was happening in heaven at that time. So, we can imagine all these heavenly beings, all these cherubims and seraphims and these great angels are around the throne of God. And, uh, you know, they are singing a hymn. I don't know exactly which hymn they sing in heaven, but we can imagine some beautiful Christian hymns, like, for example, How Great Thou Art, Right? O oh Lord my God, when an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. And then this heavenly choir is singing in the, around the throne of God. And God is looking at them and, you know, purity, holiness. Every voice is same chord. And God is scanning, you know, and then he comes to the covering cherub. And God sees something in him. And he says, hey, stop, stop. Lucifer, there is iniquity in you. He said, me? No, 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 no. He's singing like everyone else. He's praising God. No, God says, there is iniquity in you. And the wages of sin is death. And then God just, and formless body drops in the front in, in the sight of all the angels in heaven and then god says oh, where did we stop with the hymn you know let's continue eh? how great thou art what do you think how the angels would have reacted god saw it but they didn't see anything inside right so he was, god was put on the spot he cannot destroy him he can can be accused that he's a tyrant is oppressive. He's, you know, killing arbitrarily, you know, angels. So you see, this was a problem. This was a problem. And that same problem is beautifully described in the book of Job. You know the book of Job? Yeah? Chapter 1. If you go to book of Job, chapter 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God, and should evil, shunned evil. Now, let me ask you a question. You know the book of Job. He is here described, perfect man, blameless, one who fears God and shuns evil. Who is on trial in the book of Job? Is it Job or is it someone else? Who is on trial? It is God. It's God. What happens? So one day, sons of God, representatives from the planets that God has created and the worlds God had created, gathered in God's presence. Let's read from verse 6. Now there was a, one six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So, in heaven, apparently there are schedules and there are meetings and there are assemblies. Maybe, brethren, you don't like business meetings in the church to come, but you see, in heaven there are some meetings when representatives come from different parts of this created world. God is God of order. There is an order. You know, God, there is their worship, which is today. There is a time to work, six days. Yeah, God has order. There is a time to consider business. And then verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Thou. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. So what is Satan saying to God? Look, you threw me out from heaven. So I'm coming from another planet. I'm coming from the people who were created in your image. And I'm representing them. 
So, verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and eschewed evil, shunned evil. So now God is saying to Satan, Look, okay, you are coming from earth, but there is someone on earth where you claim to have power and authority, who is not following you, who is following me. He's following me. So God is challenging in a way Satan. Then look, there is someone there. This is a planet where there is a rebellion against me. But there is someone on earth who loves me and who serves me. This is my servant Job. Brother Job is there. And um, so how Satan can come from this earth to God's presence and represent this earth. Huh? What do you think about that? How Satan can come? Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Luke 4, verses 5 and 6. This is uh, from the wilderness when Jesus, uh, Satan was tempting Jesus Christ. Let's see what, what Satan told Jesus when he was in the wilderness. Luke 4, 5 and 6. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. Now, is this a legitimate claim which Satan now makes? Huh? What do you think? Now, yes and no. Yes and no. What happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they were deceived by Satan. They handed over the key to Satan. Didn't they? So what did God give to Adam and Eve in the beginning? Dominion. What is dominion? Rule. But they were forfeited. They were deceived and handed over this rule to Satan. So he's now coming to Jesus and saying, look, if you bow to me, I will give you this joy of this earth, pleasures, riches, fame. Now, Jesus in the Gospel of John also calls Satan a ruler of this world. And... Uh, they will say to Jesus, you know, all this power I will give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. What do you think? Does Satan give today to some people power and glory in this world? Not long ago we had a series of lectures here, brain, influence of the brain on the mind. And you heard some people who are movie stars and um, famous singers, what they're saying, oh well, some higher power takes control over me when I write a song or perform on the stage and I just feel in trance. Huh? They are famous. Our young people look up to them, you know. And, and, but you see, brothers and sisters, this is, <laughs> they serve, they serve these, they bow down to him. And they are having luxury homes and, you know, expensive cars. And they are traveling throughout the world. And, you know, they are in the media. They serve him. He is giving them power and enjoyment of this world. So we come back to the book of Job. And we go to verse 8 once again. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job 1.8, Job 1.8, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and shunneth evil. Blameless, upright man. Now look what Satan says to uh, God. Uh, what Satan says to God in verse nine. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, "Does Job fear God for naught or for nothing? <laughs> Is he faithful to you without any anything in return?" Look, verses ten and twelve. Has not thou made 
and hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse thee in the, to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not, not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, what is Satan saying? God blessed Job. Job was a wealthy man, prosperous man, respected man in the community. And now Satan is saying, look, Job is serving you, not because he loves you so much, but he is serving you because he has interest. He is benefiting from being loyal to you. So this is not disinterested service. He is interested what he gets from you. This is why he serves you. Now, what God can do at this moment? How can you prove what are the motives why Job serves God? How can you prove it? You take away all these blessings and see what Job will do then. We probably didn't pay attention when this story goes on in the book of Job in chapter 1. What did the sons of God say when God made that deal with Satan? Did they say something? They say one word. They are watching, exactly. They are watching. Why Job? Is Job really serving God because he loves him? They are looking unfallen worlds, what's going on. Now, if you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. John 8. Jesus is having a dialogue with the Jews, unbelieving Jews. And he is talking with them.
So from the angel's perspective, God, are you sure? These people from Toronto Church, Muslim Church, or Seminary Adventist in the city of Toronto, you know, I am, can bring them there. Now, if you go to Ephesians, brethren, this is a mysteries of the kingdom of God. If you go to Ephesians, it's beautiful, text chapter 3, and verses 8 to 10. See, when you go deeper in the Bible, then you can understand. It just opens your mind. Wow, that's it. Chapter 3, Ephesians, verse 8 to 10. Look, what is the plan of salvation about? Unto me, Paul talks, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, Apostle Paul is preaching Jesus Christ among the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. We are not Jews, right? We are Gentiles. So he was preaching unsearchable riches of Christ among the Gentiles. But is this the whole purpose of the preaching? Look, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, look, mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So there was a mystery hidden from the very beginning that was not known. But look, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by who? By the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Wow. Do you see that? So God wants to reveal something. produce, then he will come to claim them his own. I'm jumping a little bit, but I want to connect this. Why the character development is so important? I am vindicating the government of God. I'm like a job. You are like a job. Why we serve God? Who is God? Who is God's government? What the power, what Christ can do in our lives? This is why we are here on this earth. So that these Wisdom of God may be revealed by the church. He does it by means of the church. Now, Desire of Ages 761. Yet Satan, now Ellen White, by divine inspiration, brothers and sisters, in the book Desire of Ages, if you read it, there is, there is this cannot one simple little woman write such things alone without inspiration. It's impossible. Impossible. There is such deep wisdom, you know, when you, when you begin to read carefully what's in. Look what she says. Yet Satan was not then destroyed at the cross. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. Wow. They understood Satan, his character, but they have to learn more about the plan of redemption, about recovering, restoring, regenerative power of the gospel of God, God's grace. When we look at our lives, what we used to be, and how God is changing us, God wants angels to see that. Rebellious people, murderous people, liars, fornicators, adulterers, to be changed. And to be with the holy angels who have never fallen. This is what gospel can do. Do you agree with me? Do you believe that? This is the good news. This is the good news, brothers and sisters. And I read on. So certain principles have, have not yet been fully revealed. I continue. And for the sake of man, for the sake of us, Satan's existence must be continued. Men as well as angels must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. Now we have to make the choice. Angels have made the choice. But we have to make the choice. Whom shall we serve? Yes. 
uh, I cannot in this sermon have to close. Brethren, uh, I know it's, it's amazing when you begin to unpack. It just goes and goes. Maybe another sermon I will uh, preach about fall of Satan, which has four stages. Four stages. I'll tell you briefly, briefly. Stage one, Revelation 12. You know, when the dragon was cast out from heaven. Second, casting out on the cross. When Jesus says to his disciples, I have seen Satan falling from the right, like a lightning from heaven. So this is when he fell and angels said, we see it now. There is the ultimate fourth fall, which is after a thousand years, when he will be destroyed ultimately. This will be final fall. But the third stage is that one where we are involved. Through the church, he has to experience additional fall. Why 144,000 have such significant role? Why they have special privileges? Why they are with the Lamb on the, on the sea of glass? Why only they can enter into the temple? No one else. It's a special group of people who live at the end of the time, who will, in the great controversy, play an important role. This is why 144,000 such, have such important place in the great controversy. But I cannot go into that next sermon, God willing. So let me just uh, mention briefly, you know, in Nahum 1.9, Nahum 1.9, look, when the great controversy will be ended, what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Not second time. But brethren, as we go here, as I bring to the conclusion this sermon today, my question to you is, what do you actually receive at the second coming of Christ? How changed we will be when Jesus comes the second time? We agree we will get new bodies. Immortal, glorified bodies. How about our character? Huh? Shall we get new character? Not exactly. <laughs> you know, Yes and no, I agree with you. <laughs> but I mean, when I mean character, I mean, sister, you would agree with me, we could not have spirit of rebellion here on earth and go with that in heaven, right? <laughs> not that, yeah. Yeah, we have some, defi I mean, deficiencies that, you know, God, but substantial major issues in our character have to be remedied here. Have to be remedied here. We had some people this week here and we spoke with them a little bit about who are from evangelical community and who do not understand everything what we understand. And they don't like the law of God. I don't know how people can expect to go in heaven and not have the love for the Ten Commandments. Could you imagine that? <laughs> people who do not keep the commandments of God to expect to go in heaven. I don't know. I agree with love, the principle of love, but that love must lead me to obedience. Let me read our high, our high calling, page 278, paragraph 3. When Christ shall come, our vile bodies are to be changed. Bodies will be changed. And made like his glorious body. But a vile character will not be made holy then. The transformational character must take place before his coming. Our natures must be pure and holy. We must have the mind of Christ that he may behold with pleasure his image reflected upon our souls. Brothers and sisters, there are so many other thoughts did you notice that Jesus, when he was here on earth, he, he liked to talk about nature, about the plants? And what is the message there? Cultivation. Wheat and tares, you know, and plants growing. 
You see, the body will be given. New body. But the character must be cultivated. And this is why we are here today. When you come on the Sabbath to the church, when you hear good sermon, study Sabbath school, pray together, talk, holy talk on the Sabbath, this is how we build a character and when we practice the truth. Character is not formed in one day, but it is formed day by day. And day by day, as we look forward to that great day, the return of our king, this is preparation that we need today. So, let me finish with one statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. Desire of Ages 58. But this is when the great controversy will be finished. In the day of final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of truth. The cross will be presented, and its real bearing will be seen in, by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. See, God will give opportunity to everyone to see what they have lost. God will not judge anyone without full revelation. During thousand years, there will be judgment in heaven. As you know, saints will judge the unrepented sinners. I'm continuing. Before the vision of Calvary, with its mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Every lying excuse will be swept away. Human apostasy will appear in its heinous character. Men will see what their choice has been. Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy will then have been made plain. In the judgment of the universe, God will stand clear of blame for the existence and or continuance of evil. It will be demonstrated, demonstrated, that the divine decrees are not accessory to sin. There was no defect in God's government, no cause for disaffection. When the thoughts of all hearts shall be revealed, both the loyal and the rebellious will unite in declaring what? Yeah. What they will just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thy judgments are made manifest. This is Revelation fifteen, three and four. This is a unique moment in history, brothers and sisters. This is what Sister White described here, this are of ages fifty eight. Every human being who has ever lived on earth, righteous and unrighteous, will be alive at that moment. And like in a panoramic view, it will be revealed before them what they have done in their life and what they have gained or lost. Every mouth will be stopped. Everyone will realize what he or she has lost or gained. Now let me tell you something else. You and I will be there for sure. It depends on which side. Will we be in the city or outside of the holy city? That's the question. And that preparation for that place begins right now. We are in the fitting place. We have to develop character we have to show to the world what God's grace can do in our lives. Friends, now is the day. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Preparation for the second coming starts right now, these days. I heard before this service, there was one lady last night who gave her life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? It's, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Brothers and sisters, we are in the business of winning, pleading, interceding. We are ambassadors, pleading with people, be reconciled with God, accept him. He is so wonderful. He is so wonderful, brothers and sisters. Let us serve him. Let us love him. Let us invite people to accept him. There is no better government, no better place than to be with God throughout eternity. May we be there. Amen. Amen.